Do Ethics Professors Call Their Mothers? It's a long article, uh, link. <clears throat> and to me, the middle part is really compelling. So I want to I want to skip right there. Uh, the middle part is about what the author calls cheeseburger ethics. So you're in a philosophy class, and uh, the professor waxes rhetorical about veganism or vegetarianism, and it probably is true that we should stop eating animals. Hmm. It. The land usage for beef is so much higher than the land usage for vegetables. We could live so much more cheaply in terms of uh, agricultural impact on plants than we can on meat. Meat is very carbon intensive. And that's without even starting to get into the arguments about whether animals feel pain and have any kinds of rights. It's very clear that cows, like any mammal, uh, are just about as sentient as human beings, and they feel love for their children, and they panic as they're approaching the slaughterhouse. They know they're going to die. They can smell the blood. And uh, meat really is uh, murder. It's it's about as clear as it can be. And so you sit in the class and you absorb all of this and it's like a big slap in the face because we're raised to just eat meat and don't think about it, you know? We even virtue signal about meat. Uh, if you go to the Arby's and ask for a vegetarian sandwich, they'll just give you two slices of bread, you know? They'll make fun of you, the sort of the... Uh, I wanted to say the right-wing crowd, but it's absolutely not exclusive to the right-wing crowd, you know? You talk about being a vegetarian, and they uh, accuse you of physical weakness. Um, yeah, so it's like a, it can be a slap in the face learning all of this, and you really have to do some mental gymnastics again to justify eating other animals. Okay, so later in the day, you're at the college cafeteria and you see your high-minded professor who is waxing rhetorical about being a vegetarian about vegetarianism and he's eating a cheeseburger you're like prof what the fuck I thought you said we shouldn't eat meat and maybe the prof has the grace to blush or something but what are they going to do what are they going to do so this is the literally the central premise of this uh, of this article essay. The part about cheeseburger ethics. Would you would you want your professors to be held to all of the ethical standards that they propose? Is that a reasonable state of affairs? Is it important? Well, I posit that, in fact, it is important that we not hold people to those standards. The author goes on to conclude that um, there are structural reasons why becoming a vegetarian might be difficult. The school cafeteria is crowded, and there's always a line at the short order station, and they don't have time to go through short order, so they grab something pre-made, but what's pre-made is meat. There aren't vegetarian sandwiches at that part of the line, you know? Um, if you want to go to Burger King and get an Impossible Burger, you probably are paying a premium on that still. It costs more money. And so it's just more, it's just more difficult. It's a drag. It's a drain on your finances and on your time to do the vegetarian thing. And in some places, like at my campus... There's no way I can leave campus to get food if I haven't brought something with me. And honestly, uh, I'm in a classroom all day long with no break. What I have in my pocket is what I'm eating. I can't always check that my power bar was ethically sourced, you know what I mean? Um, so, 
there's a logical fallacy. It's called the argument to hypocrisy, right? So if you can catch me making an ethical statement and then show that I don't follow that ethic, you conclude that that ethic is therefore wrong. And that's not the case, that I can be both a hypocrite and right. Yeah? This is a fancy form of an ad hominem attack, uh, where you're saying I don't have the moral character to make a moral argument. But arguments are true or false on their merits, not on who is making that argument. It can absolutely be true that if more people went vegetarian or even vegan, it would save us a lot of carbon emissions and it would accord more with the stated American ethos. Um, Yeah. Being unkind to animals is probably bad for us. It, it, It shows us to be a bad moral character. So would you want everyone to be held to the moral standards that they espouse? That puts you in some quite tricky territory. It might sort of curtail the moral statements that people could make. Again, think of that ethics professor, and they're in their classroom, and they know that uh, vegetarianism would probably be better for America. The more people were vegetarian, you know, all of those savings. Um... But if they say it, then they can only eat vegetarian food. And all around them, they're going to see people just benefiting from eating meat. That they don't have to go through a special line. And nobody makes fun of them on Fox News. And their kind of food is uh, widely available. That might tend to curtail the sorts of arguments that people could make. Right? And then we couldn't possibly get to the best form of ethics, if everyone were held to the best form of ethics, if the people making the arguments were made to the arguments they espouse, then they might not make those arguments at all in the first place. Do you see the problem? Do you see the problem? What's the relevance of all this? Um, One thing is, it just is very hard to have any heroes in the modern world. Uh, You know, I grew up with, like, the Cosby show, and Bill Cosby was a comedy icon, and just that one show did so much good in the world, and then in modernity, the the public, we find out about uh, what a monster, what a monster he really was. It, It just, it's so at odds with our with our concept, with our self-concept as people who, you know, really adored him as a personality, as a comedian. Um, Yeah, having heroes just really sets you up for gross disappointment, for grotesque tragedy. These days I live without any heroes. If there's somebody who I admire... I try to identify what it is about them that is admirable and then try to emulate their admirable qualities while letting the rest go. Just let the rest go. In existential psychology, we're surrounded by like uh, failed seminarians and theologians of various religions. You know, our source material is often like Martin Buber and Adrian Van Cam and uh, Paul Tillich. Uh, Paul Tillich was a Lutheran Protestant theologian, and uh, uh, this, the, the, the stuff that he writes is just, it's amazing, it's profound, it's touching, it's this high-minded ethic. Um, often we Often we fall in love with existentialism because of because of Paul Tillich. Um, Paul said it was his mission to bring faith to the faithless and doubt to the faithful. And that's a, that's a wonderful ethos I try to live by. He describes faith as uh, uh, belief in the presence of doubt. You know, that without doubt, what you have is certainty and there's no reason for faith. 
That's not faith. It's not faith at all. It's something else. Uh, and those are just like two of the tiniest sound bites. Paul Tillich was, uh, was an amazing writer and um, philosopher. And he was into sadism and masochism. Uh, today we might call his activities BDSM. Back then it was S&M. And like in today's world, who gives even a single solitary crap? You know, if you're having fun and you're doing your consent properly, who even could begin to care about any of that? But in 1940, uh, he man, he struggled. He struggled. He could never like... It was always at odds with his own personal ethic, you know? Yeah, it was a thing that he was doing that he knew was wrong. Um, I'm not here to contend that it's wrong, but he knew it was. And so it just, it, it caused him, it caused him so much discomfort, uh, dissonance. Yeah. And like, if that wasn't a thing about him, could he have even written the stuff that he wrote? Like, without that torment forcing him to contemplate deeper matters more seriously, could he even have achieved the, 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 the philosophical standing um, that he eventually did? There's another existentialist who existentialists really like. Um, who, who writes about the relational nature of therapy, that therapy is all about the good relationship. And the stories are that the moment he gets a chance to, you know, the moment therapy isn't <clears throat> immediately solving the person's problems, he starts prescribing them drugs. <clears throat> And what are we to do? Are we to take all of our books outside uh, by this this writer? Are we to take all of those books outside and set fire to them in protest and abandon the philosophy uh, that he espouses? Or are we to reflect on the nature of cheeseburger ethics and go, uh, okay, the dude is a hypocrite. And it upsets me so much because I think his practice is wrong and his philosophy is right. So I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to try to do better than this person. And in that way, we make sort of slow, steady progress, right? I had to sit down with my mom a few years ago. And uh, I wasn't happy particularly with the way that I was raised and I brought it up, you know, in a kind and loving way, just let's clear the air and have a convo. And she says, but my mom smacked my head into a brick wall. You know, if me and my siblings were arguing, she would literally crack our heads together. And so I slapped you a few times and said some mean things to you. Um, that's far better than what my mother did to me. And then I see you with your son and you're so much better than that. And that's how we make, that's how we make progress. You know, I hope my son is better than me. That's how we make progress is we have these incremental steps of people proposing some set of ethics that from their time and place, they can't necessarily always live up to for structural reasons. And because of their history, it, you know, choices just aren't that simple. Decisions just aren't that simple. And they propose these ethics and then someone else ultimately uh, has to carry those forward and then propose their newer, even higher-minded set of ethics. Yeah. Good. I guess the example we're not going to get into today is the U.S. Constitution. But just, yeah, just think about it. Just think about the early founders' fundamental inability to live up to the one central tenet of that document, and all men are created equal. <clears throat>